James's dinner today is a vegan Caesar salad, some potatoes, baked potatoes, um, stuffed squash, Brussels sprouts, and uh, butternut squash with some green Thai curry sauce, and um, carrot juice on the side. And he's going to talk about some, it looks like some science fiction stuff. Stanislav Lem. Stanislav Lem. We'll go with Stanislav. I think he might have been Czech. More tales of Perks the Pilot. Yeah. Uh, so he's translated from. Let's just see. Stanislav. So uh, he now lives in Krakow, Poland. Uh, he might be dead now. Uh, the original Polish, I'm not sure when the original Polish was published, uh, but uh, it's translated into English in 1976. So that's quite a while back. I guess he had a bit of a, a rep. And then there's the philosophy book. I started this uh, yesterday. Big ideas simply explained. It, that's philosophy, not this book. Really, that characterizes philosophy. Big ideas, and it's more like, what's the big idea? And very simply explained or unexplained. And then uh, it's been in the news, world, soccer, records. Not the book, because this one, I think, dates to something like uh, 2010 or something like that. Uh, so 12 years ago, but uh, the the very embarrassing uh, World Cup of soccer result this just a, less than a month ago in Qatar. So my very simple Caesar salad, it's not always made this way, but lately um, Napa cabbage has been cheaper than lettuce. So I'm not using romaine, I'm using Napa cabbage. And I found that Napa cabbage is very versatile. Mm -hmm. It's great to use for all sorts of things. If you use the green um, le leaves from the top without the white stem bit, then it's great as a substitute for salad greens. And um, so it works for a Caesar salad. And you can make vegan salad, um, Caesar salad dressing very affordably and it tastes way better. Just um, buy a few limes. I found that um, limes are often given away when um, at the Salvation Army, and so that tells me if limes were more popular, they probably would be a lot cheaper because they have to give them away, so they'd have to mark up the price accordingly, right? So at least that's what I figure, and they're really easy to use. So the green Thai curry. Um, sauce that has a nice lime flavor and it's good and um, the Caesar salad dressing how you make a great Caesar salad dressing is not with lemons for a long time I was trying different things and I wasn't getting it right because I kept using lemons you use limes so if you um, put lime juice and not that much maybe maybe six lime juice of six limes with um, two tablespoons of tahini and then um, about a head of garlic, all minced up in the uh, food processor and then put some water so that you thin it to the right consistency for a dressing. Um, and that's, that's it. That makes it, oh, a little bit of salt because you won't have that Parmesan kind of flavor the, from the salt from the Parmesan, right? So if you put a little bit of salt, then it's great. And instead of croutons, use pomegranate arrows because croutons, well, that's not really food. And um, it's, it's like eating mummified bad. bread. It's so bad. Yeah. And it's, I mean, toast is better than bread. Yeah. But croutons are, are worse, worse than bread. Exactly. They're so bad. And it's bad and I bread, used to buy too. Them. You know, like it's, it's, it, isn't it always white bread? It's well, bad no, for you. Well, no, you can get other ones too, oh, but they're, can. it's not good. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's way better to get pomegranate arrows. You'll get that crunch, and it tastes better. And it looks be better, and it's way healthier. So it's 
Um, sure, a pomegranate costs a bit, but you know, for the amount of dressing that I told you about, uh, the recipe that I told you, just you know, ballpark how to make it, which that's all you need to do is ballpark. And um, you can make enough dressing for like 20 of these salads. And so that's not very expensive at all. Even if you think, oh, well, limes are pretty expensive. Well, no, not, you know, for how much you get out of the dressing. And then um, the pomegranate arrows, this, I put them on pretty generously for James here. So that's about six salads, one pomegranate. But yeah, so you could put them on sparingly and get more. It, yeah, it's, it's pretty cheap, really. Yeah, uh, so it's not that right, expensive. They're so tasty and stuff yeah. like that. You don't need to put them on. And what's really expensive is eating things that have very little or no nutritional value. Um, Croutons. Things, yeah, just things that are high money. in calories or high in uh, bad fats or sugars or whatever that's a waste or just eating real food that's not a waste low on thrills anyway yeah you're what you are you getting with uh croutons air when you think about it so it's just air so anyway that's that's all and um i know james is going to really enjoy this meal no i'm not going to eat much of it out here no because, because he'll be uh, talking the, to the you plate is so full yeah, that, and he doesn't uh, want it to fall all over I, the... Yeah, it'll yeah. be all over the place. Yeah. He, and some of it will make it under the deck and so on and so forth, which I'd prefer yeah. not to happen. I like feeding the birds, but not really high-cost stuff that they might not even like anyway. It might yeah. be poison. poisonous for them. So I was going to mention, I've been, oh. I keep on forgetting to bring the... Uh, the covers? The covers oh, for it. Uh, the, what the is front it? Cover. So it's uh, Sinue de Egipta. So Sinue. Is it Dutch? The, no. Uh, it's Sinue the Egyptian. So Nika Valtari. I might have mentioned it before, but uh, I, th I think I was saying that I finally got through it. Um, so it's over 700 pages. It's translated from the Finnish, I'm pretty sure. Well, what language is it in? Uh, German. Oh, I see. It sounds kind of weird, weird, weird. But uh, you know, German's that way. It's related to English, fairly closely related, but you know, the pronunciation's. Uh, but uh, I, I realized that uh, I was saying, oh, okay, I, I hadn't quite finished it, or maybe only halfway finished it. Um, and then I got cancer. But it had been so long when I finally picked it. It's, it was about, it's been about uh, 11 years since I put it down mm. and then went back into it. And so I'd actually got through it. I'd put a check mark. That's what I used to do to indicate uh, that I'd finished a book. And But now what I do is I, so now I, I put in after seeing that finished once and then refinished 15th of October 2022. Mm. Okay. A month and a half ago. And how was that book? Is it fiction, ah, non-fiction? Well, what it's, it's, it's in a way is a, maybe something like a historical figure. There's an Egyptian okay. story about this guy, and he went. Uh, it's it was a long time ago, and the story is uh, he was kind of like had to, I think he had escaped for his life or his exile into uh, into um, Syria from mm -hmm. Egypt. And he wandered around, made himself, uh, ingratiated himself with this, that, and the other. Now, what they've done here is they've uh, moved him into the new kingdom, uh, Sinue. And uh, so uh, I think Sinue, the, the basis for Sinue would have been a real figure, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure, as I recall, from uh, studying Egyptian history, being more like a middle kingdom and stuff like that. But he's moved. They, well, Terry moved into the New Kingdom, in the middle of the New Kingdom, too, at the start of it, as a messing around uh, with, uh, around the time of Akhenaten, and uh, it would be around the time of Tut, so King Tut figures in this as well. He's hanging with the, the biggies, and Horemheb came after Tut and stuff like that, Horemheb was a general, and he's kind of like a, the, the frenemy of Sinaway or 
Okay, so are you saying it's historical fiction? Yeah, it's historical fiction. Okay. With the emphasis on fiction. And I just always laugh when it's Egyptian stuff, so it doesn't matter if it's Colleen Gedge or what is his name, Peter Downison or Paul Downison. I think it's Peter Downison. Because all they do is they uh, take the received opinion of what uh, things were like, you know. So the, uh, the this guy's kind of suggesting it's around the time of the Exodus and stuff like that. Uh, generally, Egyptologists date the Exodus now around 1200 BC. This would be dated around 1350 BC, according to their very um, uh, wildly fantastical. Uh, chronology. How fantastical is it? It's based on Herodotus. Herodotus. And Herodotus' history of Egypt has the old kingdom coming after the new kingdom. No, no, no. The old kingdom would have ended, uh, let me see, about 700 years before the new kingdom began. And uh, that's on a sensible history. Okay, it's not uh, not uh, on the. Uh, it's even more stretched out. No, it actually isn't. Uh, they've they've scrunched down the Egyptologists. They've scrunched down the you know in order to please. I don't know who all is involved with pleasing because it's not even Herodotus. But they had to correlate. They took 200 years out, out of the Middle Kingdom around 1929 because they found a, a correlation with Mesopotamia. And they went, whoa, 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 whoa. And they actually just dropped 200 years of history. <laughs> Absolutely shameless, shamefully shameless. But, uh, but uh, the Old Kingdom ended, uh, let me see, 1,200 years before the New Kingdom ended. But Herodotus has the old kingdom coming after the new kingdom uh, in order to fill up this gap in the history he left. But they stick with his uh, dating. It's like one of these things, distance, distance, angab, the Germans call that, which is uh, a, a, where you give a distance in terms of time away from where you're at without actually giving necessarily, giving a your justification for something going back a, a certain distance. That's the only stuff I really trust unless there's an actual correlation. So uh, Chinese history is good going back to 722 BC year by year count. So when you say Chinese history of a certain sort uh, starts 722 BC or the spring and autumn annals start 722 BC, it's not a distance angaba, a giving of a, a certain distance or something like that. Because uh, I like Angaba because an Angaba is someone who's uh, uh, a fake, you know, someone's going around. So these distance Angabas are, you know, they're, they're given by distance Angabas, like, uh, like people who go around, mythomaniacs or something like that, right? <laughs> so, yeah, Herodotus, the Trojan War is 800 years before my time. <laughs> no, it wasn't. How much before his time? Herodotus, he's probably writing, let's say, around 14, 450, but we'll say, four, we'll say 450. So he won't look as, uh, well, no, we'll say 400, so he won't look as ridiculous. Uh, 400, oh, the Trojan War was a, a little over 300 years before his time. Or before, before roughly before he died. 300 years. Uh, less than 300 years before his war. <laughs> but, you know, uh, when, uh, you know, like roughly 700 BC, 720 BC, the Greeks were, uh, would have been barbarians themselves. Barbarian is the term that they applied to folks other than. Anyway, is this any good? Uh, I don't know. In any translation. Good you enough know. you read it twice. I did it to uh, practice my German. Okay. And I'm also interested in the, how. This thing it was considered a classic. Translated any number of languages. Right? So uh, kind of interested. I think it was just after uh, World War. T oh, it finished. Yeah, 1949. That's when it was uh, put out. Originally, 1949, and then uh, German translation. 59. So, so uh, 
Uh, most historical romances he's got here. Anyway, Stanislav Lem. I think he's uh, Polish. He spent some time in Krakow, Poland, it says here in the back of the, the book and stuff like that. So you never read this, right? You just gave it to me? I think it's something that we were kind Oh, of, it would have been in my, library. yeah, it would have been in my collection in the basement yeah. of and discards, I, yeah. library discards. Yeah, exactly right. And I, just, you weren't I that meant to get to it, the, and then I mm. thought, okay, that's it, yeah. I'm moving out of my house. Because I've threatened to move out of my house several times, and then I get... Uh, well, usually something happens like weather, or my back gets hurt, or, you know, something happens, and I'm just like, oh, I guess I'm staying. For, or we run <laughs> know, into interesting real estate agents. We're whatever. not going to say why. Mm. So interesting. But uh, this is, uh, I don't know what the term is. It's not fantasy sci-fi. It's the hardcore sci-fi, like the hard science sort of stuff. And it's, uh, you know, I can remember when I was watching the... Uh, they used to stop school when they were doing things like building up to the moon landings and stuff like that. And they bring the t take him to the gym, bring the TV out, watch, watch, watch. Eventually, as a kid, if you first as a kid, you're going excited, and then you go, no, it's boring. It's just everything's it's so cut and dried. Very few people, at least in the American, we don't know about the Russians. You know, they had people dying. They they killed a dog, Laika. Yeah. You know, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, like, they, even, even way back when, you know, like when they were doing the first balloon things, this is in the 18th century, the 1700s, let's say 1780. Montgolfier, I think is the name of uh, a couple of brothers involved, they sent animals up, but they made sure, or they, they, they weren't sure if there was enough atmosphere them, for them up there. And if the balloons had gone up high enough, they would have uh, died. But they brought the animals down alive. You know? But the Russians, no, no. Let's send this. Uh, let's send this dog up and uh, die, you know, have it dead and stuff like that. Shame on you, you Soviet pukes. There's some nice Russians in the world, so I don't want to say shame on you, you Russians. So there's some very nice ones. And uh, anyway, this is. Uh, it took me a. This is a little over 200 pages. It took me a long, long So not a good time. Not a good time. <laughs> which was a great time. But it's actually well written. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a big fan of sci-fi, I, I gotta say. I don't mind it. You know, I actually prefer sci-fi like a Marvel comics or something like that. All right, so you're going to That's talk it. a little about philosophy then? Well, I'm going to talk about world soccer oh, because it's been in the news, uh, oh, World Cup. It? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. Well, you don't follow the news quite the way. The news that you follow is the stuff that I, that it tends to get filtered uh, through me. I don't blame you for not wanting to listen to the news. It's awful. I started listening to the news when a certain plague hit mankind. I don't want to mention it because I don't want us yeah. to get in trouble. Uh, that sort of stuff. Yeah, we won't even talk about yeah. it anymore. Exactly right. So, uh, yeah. Although I'm going to say about a certain play, I'm not. We oh, were, I write all sorts of poetry about it yeah. on my and, blog. Uh, I we do were so up, accurate about it, so yet. accurate about it. Yeah. We, we made all sorts of predictions, but I'm not going to say what plague it, it was. You know, it, it might have been uh, the uh, N pox or uh, the O pox or the P pox or something like that. It might have been strep. Uh, X or something like that, but uh, yeah, we're not going to say what it was because we don't want the authorities uh, doing some major league censorship on us. At any rate, um, even though, as I say, we were accurate, we were predicting stuff before again and again. Anyway, uh, yeah, so the World Cup happened, uh, I think, uh, less than a month ago. And one of the things I like is uh, now people will be saying, Lionel Messi is one of the greatest of all time, maybe the greatest of all time. Leave him maybe off. Right? When it comes to playing offensive soccer, Lionel Messi is the best ever. Though know, we've had people strutting around saying, big guys, you know, like they're the ones who get things done in sports. And even in soccer, and I, well, uh, they're the ones that have made soccer more and more and more boring. Big guys have got to hold on to people. they got to lay their bodies on people. 
And soccer doesn't allow that. Soccer only allows it. You know, it used well, to. Well, in the goal. A, a goaltender, it's better to be tall. You'd better be thin. It's a big goal. Could, it's a big goal. It's a pretty big goal to cover. Now the goals should be made bigger, or they should do something. Because even now, uh, there are so many games are decided. You know, there's a, a zero-zero tie, and then they go into overtime. This is zero-zero tie, and then they have penalty kicks, which are as boring as all get out. Except it's nerve-wracking because for the person shooting it would. Be. Well, you're you're going. Uh, if someone misses, your team's probably going to lose. So they have five five guys aside initially. There's no way something that important should be decided on just goal kicks, you know. And uh, it's it's uh, it's it's almost like flipping a coin. Or Weird things can happen. I can remember one time Chelsea was going up against who was it they were playing against? Um, was it Manchester United or something like that in the final? And John Terry gets up there. No, he shouldn't have been taking a penalty. He's a big. I've been talking about big, clumsy guys, big, clumsy defensemen. I would never have let him take it. Anyway, it was a rainy day in Moscow, mm -hmm. and uh, he went and he uh, he slipped, and uh, boom, that uh, cost them the uh, what is it, uh, the European uh, Championship. But uh, the other day, a, a guy called Pelé died, and he was considered, might still be considered, the greatest ever. I knew he was getting worried when he started bad mouthing. This is recently. I don't think he was going Senna. He started bad mouthing Lionel Messi. Now, there have been a lot of people who have been talking about Cristiano Ronaldo. Apparently, he was cut loose from Manchester United uh, just recently. Uh, he's one of these uh, big guys, uh, arrogant uh, big guys. He's quite talented, not nearly as talented as he thinks. He's, uh, he used to be fast. I don't know if he is anymore. But uh, who did he sign? He signed on, on with uh, some team in uh, Arabia. <laughs> wow, oh. oh, his, his star seems to have fallen uh, quite badly. You remember uh, there was one story of him in a dressing room. I guess he had a man purse or something like that, and he uh, was putting a. Was it? He was saying he needed it to put his dog in or something like that. It was uh, his dog was like so small it was like Lionel Messi. So Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> You can't even get Portugal. Uh, has Portugal ever got even into the final of the uh, World Cup? No. At any rate, uh, poor Pele, I'm afraid he died as a result of Messi winning the uh, World Cup. You know, he's going, oh man, you know, now uh, there people are going to be considering him um, uh, greater than me. And the, the weird thing is there's this weird, weird... Uh, attitude coming down. You know, there's a guy called Bart Starr. This is boring to Pauline and stuff like that, so I'll apologize to her later, but I apologize to her now. But uh, Bart Starr, he uh, led the league in passer rating I don't know how many times. Uh, was it five times? Maybe less. But at least, I think it was five times. So he was a uh, quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. And how many times did they win the NFL championship while he was quarterback? At least, I got to think. He was uh, in fight in <coughs> in playoff and uh, and final games. He was nine out of ten, ninety percent. Uh, you got a guy called Tom Brady. He's about seventy-five percent. And everyone's going around saying he's a god, Tom Brady, goat. He's the greatest of all time. I'm going. Yeah, he's led the league in passer rating twice. Bart Starr, I think it's five times. And then Bart Starr, when it came to big games, was bigger. But I'm not interested in big games. I'm just interested in passer, passer rating because, you know, Tom Brady, the last time he, he was on a, I was going to say won a uh, Super Bowl, he didn't win it. It was done on Kansas City's, was it Kansas City's with? Uh, their defense, Tampa Bay, I think it's Tampa Bay, it's, they just did it on their defense, you know, like, uh, and, and their running game. So Tom Brady's handing out, here, take this, uh, I don't want the responsibility, because when I, I'm, I'm sack, I'm sack bait, when, I, when I've, I've got the ball behind the, you know, you look at his stats, and he's, he's awful. When you look at him, 
I'd rather have Joe Montana in a Super Bowl. Why? Tom Brady, in the big games, he coughs up the ball. Hey, here, here's an interception, folks. Joe Montana, four Super Bowls, no interceptions. Okay? And that was a passing offense. Pass, pass, pass. So, uh, but poor old Pele, I'm afraid he died because he just uh, couldn't accept the fact that Messi was maybe better. Now, how much time have we got? Five minutes? Um, yeah. Okay, Less. So, so we're going to look at big ideas simply explained. We left off the other day, and Pauline maybe should just go inside uh, because <laughs> it's boring, boring stuff. Where did we leave off? Sorry for the dead air here. This is not radio. You can look at the stuff in the background. Languages of skin. Life will be lived all the better if it has no meaning. Think like a mountain. Yeah, we dealt with that. The fundamental sense of freedom is freedom of change. Yeah, languages is social art. No kidding. Willard Van Orman Klein. Uh, so, in order to see the world, we must break with our familiar acceptance of it. Maurice Merleau Ponty. Yeah, that's probably true. I don't know how profound it is. Reason lives in language. Mm. I think you can reason using pictures or stuff like that. I don't know about it, living in language. You know, like, uh, how about if you're reasoning uh, about um, in geometry? You know? uh, this would be deductive reasoning. You could actually do inductive reasoning. You might yip and yap about it, but ultimately it's uh, kind of like pictures. Reason lives in language, so that's... Emmanuel Levinas, or Levinas, The Manality of Evil, Hannah Arendt. Uh, so is evil banal? Yeah, it can be, but uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say Saddam Hussein's banal, Putin, not banal. There are some types of evil that are banal, like uh, he, she was talking, I think, about Adolf Eichmann. Uh, existence precedes essence, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, yeah, it's probably true. I, I don't know how profound it is. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if there's any such thing as essence, really. It, it's just existence is. Uh, why essentialize something after something exists? Intelligence, so Jean-Paul Sartre is an existentialist. That existence, that's the whole thing, right? Intelligence is a moral category. Theodore Adorno. Yeah. And, you know, Theodore Adorno, and his ilk, he was the kind of guy that wanted to... Uh, he, he didn't like Hollywood, and he didn't like, I'm sure he didn't like rock and roll, and stuff like that. So, intelligence is a moral category. He was stupid, and that means, as far as I'm concerned, he was immoral. There's no excuse for someone who uh, is uh, not Down syndrome or something like that for being stupid. Adorno, I'm talking to your ghost, you were stupid and you were immoral. He was uh, one of these stupid Marxists from the Frankfurt School. Insofar as the scientific statement speaks about reality, it must be falsifiable. Karl Papa. So, uh, you know, like, uh, here's the thing.